the valley of death. Hello. Your goodness and your mercy are with me. I can walk through tough times, situations, but I know I'm not alone. Your name is Emmanuel, God with us. I say I'm not alone. I want to speak to somebody here in the presence of the Most High God. I want to say with confidence, you are not alone. In whatever situation you're going through, even when nobody thinks that it's going to work, I say you are not alone. The God Almighty is with you. The God Almighty is with you. Even if you are in broken pieces, He is able to build you up again. I was saying you are not alone. I want to confess I'm not alone. I want to say it loudly. I'm not alone. I want to say it with confidence. I'm not alone. When things are falling apart and nothing seems to work for me, and everybody has already given me a sentence of failure. I know one thing for sure, I'm not alone. In my deep downs, in my deep downs, When nobody could have given me a chance. You've been there. When it couldn't work for me in everything that I've tried. I could still know that you are with me. That's why boldly I can say I'm not alone. Oh. Comfort. Comfort. My comfort. You my comfort. Jesus, thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Can we give him a hand of applause? A hand of applause, a hand of applause. Can we give him a hand of applause? Yes, 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 yes. He is Emmanuel. 
God with us. He is Emmanuel. God with us. He is Emmanuel. God with us. He is Emmanuel. Alleluia. Alleluia. Before you sit, look the person around you, tell them you are not alone. Look to the right side, say you are not alone. To the left side, say you are not alone. Tell them you are not alone. You are not alone. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You are welcome in the house of the Most High God. I welcome you in the house of the Most High God. For people who are watching us on Facebook or who later will watch us on YouTube, I want to let you know that you are at Rema Jesus is Ministries. You are at the right place. You have to stay at his place. Don't try to move away because God has an appointment with you. He has a date with you. He want to meet with you and this morning he want to speak to you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We are, I'm going to to continue or to start with my series on increase our faith. Last Sunday, I've started uh, increase our faith and I only introduced, I only introduced and uh, the Holy Spirit led me to what something else because he wanted to speak to somebody and uh, 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 we are servants of the Most High God. The service is not ours. The church is not ours. The service is God's. The church is God's. And we let him do what he wanna do. Hallelujah. Increase our faith is actually the topic of our series that uh, we are starting. And I was telling you there are several kinds of prayers that we find in the Bible. You have long prayers, you have short prayers, and there was one time in the Bible that you find a very short prayer, a prayer with only three words. And this prayer is what gonna make the object or the subject of our series for the next Sundays to come. Increase our faith. It's, uh, you find it in Luke chapter 17, verse 5. And uh, the apostles say to the Lord, increase our faith. Increase our faith. When you look at this word increase, and you find it in the Greek word, it's the word prostitoni. Prostitoni, that means place additionally. Add again and again. When here the disciples are speaking about to increase their faith, they are saying, add on what we have some more and add more to the point that what is added starts to be multiplied and when it multiplied we get we get it more in numbers and proportions compared to what we had before and they are he's here asking god to increase their faith to increase their faith and faith here being like being the reliance upon Christ for salvation and for miracles. They are actually asking God 
to come and bring us and increase in our lives and bring in our lives what will give us a confidence to rely on receiving salvation from you but also receiving miracles they did not say to god to jesus to keep their faith burning they didn't say to jesus to sustain their faith but they are praying to jesus to say increase our faith increase our faith and I was saying last Sunday, it is necessary, it is important to see growth in our faith. To see growth in our faith. But the way they prayed here, it's not about only adding something on our faith. But bring our faith to receive more and more and more and more to the point that it can be multiplied in multiple hallelujah and jesus replied saying to them you're gonna see it uh, uh it's in verse six don't worry it's not on the screen he said to them if you have faith as small as a mustard seed you can say to this mulberry tree the mulberry tree be uprooted and planted in the sea and it will obey Jesus speaking here about a mulberry tree. And last Sunday I was telling you the mulberry tree, it's a, a, a tree that is very specific in the point that it grows too fast. It grows too fast. And in no time it becomes a huge or a big tree. And uh, the other thing, it wood is very, very very good it's wood it's very good very strong and durable to the point that it's used it's used a lot uh in making coffins in making caskets because you need something that is rot resistant when you make something like that and the mulberry tree is one of the kind of the tree hallelujah i say it grows fast but the other thing also, not only that it grows fast, Jesus says you can ask it to go out to be uprooted. Why? Because mulberry trees, like fig trees, are kind of trees that have deep roots. It's only not going higher, but it has deep roots. To the point that the farmers, they know it's not easy to uproot a mulberry tree that is already grown up. It's easy to cut it, but difficult to uproot. But Jesus says, when you ask me to increase your faith, I want to just tell you, if you can have faith of the size of the mustard seed, mustard seed, it's seed, it's one of the smallest seeds that exists ever. I say the size of a mustard seed, it's about one millimeter to maximum two millimeter. It means you take one centimeter, you divide by 10, you get the size of that round small seed. Jesus said, that small seed, if your faith can be just in a size of that small seed, you can speak to the great mulberry tree that is very rooted and that never been uprooted by anybody. You speak to it to say, be uprooted. And the, by Jesus says, it will be. And he says, not only be uprooted, but he says, uh, be uprooted and do what? and uh, be planted in the sea why in the sea because the mulberry tree doesn't grow in the presence of too much water a mulberry tree usually grows in area that is areas that are dry but jesus says what is impossible to somebody to do what is impossible to the nature to do faith can make it happen you're gonna speak to this mulberry tree that never need water for it to grow even if it goes to the sea you will say be planted there at the mulberry tree will be planted hallelujah are you with me now when you you look at what jesus is saying here you have to come back to the context the context of what jesus uh, the context where could be taken 
this verse increase our faith can you bring me my presentation back please when you go back you find in luke chapter 17 verse 3 to 5 verse, verse 3 to 4 because verse 5 it's where the apostle prayed and said increase our faith Verse 3 to 4, the Bible says, so Jesus, so watch yourselves. Jesus speaking. He says, if your brother or your sister sins against you, rebuke them. And if they repent, forgive them. Jesus says, if your brother or your sister, the word brother here in the Greek, it's your fellow brethren your fellow disciple the other people who are looking to know jesus like you and who walk with you jesus says if that fellow disciple happens actually to sin against you i don't know what he has done i don't know what she has done against you maybe you have heard that he has been or she has been gossiping about you maybe you have heard that she is or he is jealous against you maybe you have heard that he has said something that is not uh, actually uh, actually recommendable and you feel in your heart uh, that you are you are angry you feel that you have to go and see the brother and uh, reprehend him jesus says what you can do just go yes rebuke them and if they repent forgive them now that is not all jesus go further verse 4 to say even if they sin against you seven times not in a year but seven times in a day even if they sin against you seven times in a day and seven times come back to you saying i repent jesus says uh, not that you may forgive them not but you can forgive them but jesus says you must forgive them hallelujah you must forgive them now i, I want you to understand is saying this brother has actually sinned against you seven times seven times seven times seven times he has sinned against you seven times don't sleep please he has sinned against you seven times and he says you must forgive him now do you understand now the context the context of these people coming and saying to jesus increase our faith because what Jesus was asking them was humanly impossible. Somebody sins against you once and comes and says, I'm sorry. You say, yes, I forgive you. Second time he comes, I forgive you. Jesus says, even if it's seven times during a day, seven here is not the number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. But Jesus says uh, the perfect number, even if it goes about 27 times, if it goes about 46 times in a day, no matter the numbers perfectly done by him in the day to come and sin against jesus said you must forgive him we live in a country we live in a time where forgiveness has become a problem we live in a country where there is bitterness uh, there is unforgiveness that has been going in the heart of people for so many years and jesus is comparing this uh, to the mulberry tree because the mulberry trees grows so fast and so easily the same way bitterness and unforgiveness grows in our heart so easily people become bitter so easily people become unforgiving what you have done to me, I will never forgive you. How many times we have heard somebody saying that, but how many times have you gone to God to ask for forgiveness? People are so ready to criticize. This man of God has, fall down, has fallen down. This man of God has done this. This brother has done that. But how many times you have asked for forgiveness to God? We have a pleasure to come and expose people, to a pleasure to go and share the, on, on, on WhatsApp whatever a man of God has done, whatever somebody has done. But how many times when now you have done the same thing, but you have been hidden? The only difference between you and him is because you have not yet been exposed by God. Don't expose anybody because God can also expose you. 
When you share everything that everybody shares on WhatsApp, on social media, when we be somebody, a man of God, a child of God, I don't know why I'm talking about it, it's become now like a mockery for everybody. And you are sharing it. And you are part of the kingdom of God. The Bible says uh, that kingdom that is divided doesn't subsist, sustain. We cannot be sharing the devil the, the pleasure and the glory of him knowing that the child of God has sinned. We have to forgive our brothers and we have to go to them and forgive them. For people who are from DRC Congo, they know how many scandals have been on the last week and it has been on social medias because this pastor has done this, that pastor has been, uh, I don't know, recorded doing something wrong and it has been distributed, shared like nobody business on WhatsApp, on Facebook. Even people who don't have data, they have data to share that. But when you, it's, it's about sharing things that are important for people to be saved, you don't have data for that. Shame on you. And when I saw that, when we saw that, we were talking about uh, with, uh, with colleague friends uh, and medical doctors and servants of God here in South Africa. I told them the first attitude that we must have is to pray for this man of God. And I will tell you, we have spent three nights, Thursday, Friday, and yesterday, Saturday, from every 23 hours to one o'clock praying for a man of God who has fallen and who has become a mockery for people. Because it's not my part to judge him. It's not my part to take part, to take portion in the group of the people who are mocking him because of what he has done. My part is to forgive him and to pray for him. Jesus says you must forgive them. Even if they've done it seven times. I was, I, I was writing to somebody in the WhatsApp group, I think Congolese in Port. Somebody said, no, this man has done it too much. I said, no, even if he's done it too much, we still have to forgive him. That way, Jesus has increased, the apostles says, increase our faith. Can we here together say, God, we need that you increase our faith. To the point that things that are humanly impossible will be able to try to do them. Jesus says, forgive, 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 forgive again, forgive again, forgive. Jesus didn't say gossip, gossip. Gossip, 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 and go and share it. That's why when we pass on the corridor, people are looking at you and mm, it's him. If you knew that every time you point your finger to somebody, three are coming back to you. And one goes back to, well, goes to God and a bigger one. Are you accusing the God who has created that man who has called him? Somebody was telling me, uh, what I was saying even yesterday, who, uh, you, you, somebody was saying, uh, uh, the Bible says, uh, don't touch my anointed. And somebody says, who, how will we know that he's anointed? Nobody needs to prove to you that he's anointed. The God who is anointing him is able to prove to you that he's anointed him. Don't ever find yourself in a mistake of just preparing yourself to bring a man of God down. That is wrong attitude. That is not Christian. Increase our faith. The disciples spoke to, to told Jesus. Knowing that the task is humanly impossible. The disciples asked God to increase their faith. But there is another context then. Than this that can be derived from the book of Matthew. When the apostles tried to cast out the evil spirit on the child who had a spirit of epilepsy and failed, they asked to Jesus, why could we not cast him out? Matthew chapter 17, verse 19 to 20. It says then the disciples came to Jesus because Jesus actually when he came, he rebuked the evil spirit and the child was healed completely. Was healed completely. And they asked Jesus, why couldn't we drive out this demon? That was their question. Look at, listen to the answer of Jesus. Jesus replied to them, because you have so little faith. The point that you could not drive out that demon, it's because your faith is so little, so little, less than a mustard. You need a faith that reaches at least the size 
of mustard seed. I'm not asking you to have a big faith uh, filling up this building. I don't ask you to have a big faith filling up your room. I'm saying a faith of the size of a mustard seed is enough. Because you have so little faith. Truly, I tell you, if you have faith as small as this mustard seed, Jesus said, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Because nothing is impossible to those who believe. If you look at me here, you will see that Jesus has already pointed three impossible situations for human beings, but that faith can move. Number one, he says, it is not easy to uproot a mulberry tree. And I've explained to you, if you're a student in botany, I've told you what is a mulberry tree, how it is so rooted, and how it goes so high and become bigger, that it's impossible almost to, for it to be uprooted. Jesus says it's not easy to uproot a mulberry tree. But if you are, if you have, you, 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 you have faith, you can uproot it. You, pr you probably can cut a mulberry tree. But it is extremely difficult to approach it. But by faith, you can do it. Second situation, Jesus says mulberry trees cannot grow in a sea. It is impossible to plant a mulberry sea, uh, tree in a sea or in water and it grows. But if you have faith, you can do it. Second impossible situation. And the third impossible situation, Jesus saying, if it, I know you cannot even shake a small hill, let alone moving a mountain from here to there. But if you have faith, you can move a mountain. Now you have seen three impossible situations. So what Jesus was actually saying was a faith as small as a mustard seed, seed would make the impossible possible in your life. It will make the impossible possible. You need to have faith as small as a mustard seed. Now, if you find that your faith is so small that you are unable to move those kind of three situations, then you and me, our prayer will be increase our faith. I want to show you, people of God, and I want us to go through this today and next Sunday, four reasons why you need to increase your faith. I say four reasons why we need uh, increased faith. Four reasons uh, for important things first faith can bring about in our lives. Number one, we need faith to fulfill our calling in life. Number two, we need faith to see God's works and wonders in our lives. Number three, we need faith to please God. And number four, we need faith that produces works. And today, I hope that uh, I will do justice to the first two points in 30 minutes uh, that I speak to you about the first two reasons. And next Sunday, I'll go with the other two reasons. And I will tell you next Sunday, from there, I'll start to speak to you. How can you increase your faith? One, you need or we need faith to fulfill our calling in life. We need faith to fulfill our calling in life. I've heard somebody saying, mm, yes, I'm saying, mm. you need faith to fulfill your calling in life. All of us believe that we are called by God. We have purpose in life and we need to fulfill in our lifetime. God has placed you where you are, in the time frame you are, the people you are around with, with a clear purpose. You are not here by mistake. You are not here by any chance. You are in purchase room for a role. You are in purchase room in this time in 2022 because God has a purpose for you in Poch in 2022. It's not by any chance. Somebody will tell me, I wanted to be in Pretoria, but I got a job in Poche's room. Somebody among the students will tell me, I've applied for Stellenbosch. I wanted to be in UCT, but God sent me in NWU. I say it's not by any mistake that you are here. It's for a purpose. God is not a chancer. He's not a chance taker. God knows what he wants with you. He has a purpose for your life. The fact that this Sunday morning you came and sit in this hall, it's for a purpose. 
The fact that you are watching me on Facebook or watching us later on YouTube, it's for a purpose. As we read in Acts chapter 17, verse 26, the Bible says, From one man he, had, he made all the nations, that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out the appointed times in history. He marked out the appointed times in history. He marked out the appointed times. When you read it in Amplified Version, it says, he having def definitely determined their allotted periods of time. There is a time that has been allotted to you for you to do something with a purpose. God has marked it, which means you are expected to fulfill the call and the purpose for which God placed you where you are. What is your calling? Why are you where you are? Why are you in Rema Jesus' ministries now? It's for a purpose. It's not for you to fill up or to warm up our chairs. It has been cold for long. It doesn't need you to warm it up. God has called you not to warm up any chair here. It's for another purpose. For you to have your hands dirty in the ministry. And do what God wants you to do. Hallelujah. And if it's something that I cannot get mistaken of. I know that God has called you. For you to bring some more people here. For the empty chair next to you be filled by you. Because you have a purpose that God has brought, has brought you for it. People. When God calls you for a task, sometimes it requires that you move out of your comfort zone. The problem with many of us, we like our comfort zone. No, I was saying we love our comfort zone. We want to be where we are. Do what we, 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 are, we are always used to do. We don't want any change in our life. But God says, I've moved you to Pochef's room. Not to be the same kind of Christian that you were before. Sitting in a church, listening to a pastor on Sunday. I have called you for something else. That you have to be able to do when I want you to do it. Comfort zone comes and kills the, 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 the purpose of God in your life. Comfort zone makes you feeling like you are okay where you are. Even when you are not okay. You will lie to people, you won't lie to God. There is something burning in your heart for so long that you felt that you could also do like your brother. You could also do like your sister. You could also do like your leader. Why can't you, can't I also preach? Why can't I also go and look for people who are sick and pray for them? There is something burning in your heart. But your comfort zone tells you again, stay where you are. You are so good where you are. You are not so good where you are. Moving out your comfort zone is not always easy. It requires a great deal of faith. It requires a great deal of faith. When God has called me to be a missionary, an evangelist, going un uh, to underprivileged place to preach the gospel, and after four years ago, when he called me to be the senior pastor of this church, I could have started negotiating with God to say, it is good for me to be in Pochev's room. It is good for me to see people sitting in beautiful chairs. Then I preach to them on Sunday. I can be put immediately on live Facebook. It is good for me to continue every Sunday preaching. God says, John Claude, you don't have to feel yourself good in your comfort zone. I want you sometimes out of this church, being in a village somewhere where nobody knows you, where nobody sees you you but you go seeking for those souls that are lost i have a purpose in life and i will never deny it nobody will deny me that purpose nobody will tell me not to do that because i know what god has called me for and i do it god increase my faith increase my faith I'm going to Togo next week, next month. I'm going to Lome, to, to villages in Togo. God has already prepared me, saying, Jean-Claude, this won't be easy. And I've seen already battles starting with me. Because seeking for the lost soul of God is not easy. There's voodoo in Benin and in Togo stopping people to receive Jesus Christ. And God wants to send a somebody from somewhere 
and to go and seek for them. Is it because there's no people in Togo? No, there are many people in Togo. But God wants me to have also my dirt and my hand dirty in Togo. Comfort zone will tell you stay where you are. But faith tells you do what God wants you to do. That's why you pray, increase my faith. Increase my faith. When in the morning and Sunday morning, people are driving left and right, looking for people to bring to church. It's not because they don't have anything to do. They know they have a purpose to do in the kingdom of God. And they've offered their time, offered their money, offered their cars, offered their, their fuel to go and seek for those people. Comfort zone makes somebody to do what God wants him to do. Even when you think that he's wasting his fuel, when the fuel costs now too much, but it tells you, I know what I do. I don't want to stay in my comfort zone. I even drove this morning to go to the little shop to bring, for, to bring people to come to church. You know what? I found all of them sitting, drinking already. It was 10 minutes to 9. And all of them gave me excuses. I said, Pastor, we're going to come to church next Sunday. I left that place. My heart was bleeding. But God says, that's what you have to pay the price for that. It's, it's not always going well. Sometimes you don't get what you want. I wanted at least to bring at least one person to church. Even the last one came and says, I wanted to come with you, but my mother is sick. I can't leave my mother alone. Yesterday, I visited them afternoon, and one of them was telling me, uh, my mother wants to come to church, but I don't have pampas, and my mother needs pampas. You promised last Sunday to bring us pampas, but you didn't give me pampas. It was not me. I don't know who promised them. Then I was looking around in my pocket. I didn't have money. Then I said, let's drive to town. When I come back, I'll bring it to you, or tomorrow come to church, I'll give you pampas. But that lady this morning was not happy at all. Because I didn't bring pampas, she refused to come to church. I was talking about comfort zone. We need faith to fulfill our calling. But your comfort zone will tell you. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm, not that mm -mm, you can do this mm -mm, not that when I compare the calling of two people in the Bible speaking about Paul and Peter it surprises me ask me why all of us know Paul Paul had a strong Jewish background he was a learned man well versed in scriptures, Paul had studied under the feet of Gamaliel, a great doctor of the law, a great scholar. He almost memorized the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Leviticus, Numbers, what? Deuteronomy and Exodus, the second one. He almost memorized all of them. This Paul, very good in the law. Humanly speaking, he would have been the perfect choice and ideal candidate to minister to Jews because he had all the qualities to minister under the Jews. But while Paul did minister to Jews, his ministry was predominantly called to go to the Gentiles. The Gentiles had little appreciation for his great learning. They did not even know what it means to know the first five books in the Bible, to be a scholar, to be studying under Gamaliel. They didn't need that, but Paul had, a, had to get rid of human wisdom and put complete faith on God to minister to Gentiles. That's why when you listen to him in Philippians chapter 4, Paul speaking in Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. Philippians chapter 4, when you listen to Paul, move, 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 move the slide. Paul speaking in Philippians chapter 4, he says, Wow, if someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, 
as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faithless. But whatever were against to me are now considered loss for the sake of Christ. Paul speaking about himself, he could boost himself about who he is. He was a true Jewish. He was a true Jewish, knowing the Jewish law, knowing the Jewish culture, knowing the Jewish way of doing things. And Paul could have been the right person to be sent to Jewish. But God took Paul and sent him to the Gentiles. While Peter now, compared Peter now to Paul, when you look at Acts chapter 4, verse 13, it describes Peter as an unlearned person, an ignorant man, unschooled, ordinary man. He was an ordinary fisherman, but God used him to minister to educated men in Israel. Probably, Peter would have been a perfect choice, a perfect choice for Gentiles, but if Peter's calling had to be fulfilled, he had to put complete faith in Jesus. Listen to me. Why am I giving you these two examples? It's because God has marked each of us for a definite purpose, and as a high calling, none of us has an ordinary calling. None of us has to undermine is or a calling when looking at others' calling. None of us should say my calling is smaller than the pastor's one. Tridia, you told me that every time I go to preach somewhere, you want to go with me and intercede for me. Your calling is not smaller than my calling who's preaching. You and me shall be doing the same work. And in the kingdom of God, God pays everybody who, does, who is doing it but doing it faithfully when you recognize your calling the problem is your calling you have to do it with faithfulness hallelujah hallelujah i was talking about faith we need faith to do what to fulfill our calling now paul had to had to ask to God faith for him to go to the Gentiles, while Peter also needed to have faith for him to go to educated people. Because when people were looking at him, they say, Oh, we know this boy, we know this man is just a fisherman. Can he come and talk to us? We have PhDs, we have masters. But li listen to me. You need your faith increased for you to go wherever God wants you and to bring the gospel. God, increase our faith. That's why nobody here should have said or can ever say, my calling is too small, I cannot fulfill it. Even if it's too small, even if it's too big, you need faith. And to say, God, give me enough faith to fulfill my calling. What is your calling? What is your calling? The main one, he says, Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, go and make disciples. Go. Go, 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 and make disciples. Go. It's not, it's not there, leave it. Go, make disciples. Go and make disciples. You don't wait. You don't wait and ask yourself, when will I do it? How will it happen? Go, 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 and make disciples. Paul says, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. You have a high calling of God and there is the prize for this high calling. That's why you need to increase your faith. You need faith so you will be able to fulfill the calling of God in your life. Lack of faith will make you vulnerable. Lack of faith can actually prevent us from fulfilling God's purpose in our life and from doing the fullness of what God has called us for. People, there's an example in the Bible. You know Saul. And all of us know of David. He was someone who was highly commended by God. But David was actually... A second chance speaking humanly speaking a second chance because someone else failed to fulfill god's purpose i'm saying david was a second chance a second choice i want to say when you look humanly 
People will say, yes, Saul has been king because it's the people who, who wanted him to be king. Yes, the people of Israel, when they looked around the neighborhood, they saw that everybody had a king and they went to God to say, we want also a king who rules over us. Because they were still under theocracy where God was ruling over them and he had prophets who were playing the roles of kings sometimes also. But they says they wanted king like other people. And God says, yes, I will give you a king. But read with me to know and to see that it was a choice of God. 1 Samuel chapter 9 verse 17. 1 Samuel chapter 9 verse 17. Uh, when Samuel caught sight of Saul, the Lord said to him, this is the man I spoke to you about. He will govern my people. Who spoke to Samuel? God said to Samuel, this is the man. While Saul went with a servant out looking for the donkeys of the father that was lost. He was looking for the donkeys, but God had a plan for him. He met a man of God, a prophet, who spoke to him and said, The donkeys that you have been looking for, that have been lost for three days before, have already been found. But what I want for you, you go towards. Go and wait for me uh, at the high city, high place of God. Today I'm going to eat with you, and tomorrow I will tell you what God wants you to know. And the following day, God came, uh, the, the prophet came, the seer came and spoke to him to say, God wants you to be the, the ruler of this country. He actually told him, uh, to whom is the desires of the whole Israel people? Is it to you and to the house of your father? Now listen to this. This man already lacked of faith. He showed lack of faith. Verse 21, Saul, when he heard what God told him, uh, he, answered the, the, he answered to the prophet, but I am, am I not a Benjamite from the smallest tribe of Israel and is not my clan the least of all the clans of the tribe of Judah. Why do you say such thing to me? Why do you say such thing to me? I was telling you we need the faith to fulfill the calling of God in our lives. When there is no faith, you miss the call of God in your life. When God called him, he saw Saul and he saw in Saul a hero. But so looking at himself, you are seeing a zero. Don't see yourself zero when God sees you hero. Don't call yourself nothing when God sees you everything. The problem of us, uh, it's when God calls you to do what he wants you to do. You think that you're going to do it with your own abilities. You look at yourself. You say, I don't have this diploma. I don't have this knowledge. I don't have this one. No, God doesn't have anything to do with what you have. He has all things to do with what he is. Who he is, uh, is able to make you everything that you don't have. You need faith to fulfill your calling. You need faith. Don't be like a soul who looked at himself. He says, I am from the least of all the tribes of Israel. My grandfather is Benjamin. Benjamin was the last born. And the, our tribes it was the smallest. Yes, if you see the numbers of the people of the 12 tribes, the Benjamites were the, the least of numbers. Even when they were going to wars, the Benjamites were always behind because they were not considered. But God considered what, considers what people have thrown away. And he says, I've chosen you. Who are you not to believe in uh, God's calling? To the point that it, uh, it happens at one time when he became even the king and God was working with him. He showed again that he lack of faith. He showed again lack of faith. Can you go with me in 1 Samuel chapter 13 from verse 9? There is a story, the story there. Israel under Saul the king found themselves in front of Philistines. The Philistines wanted to attack them. And Saul called upon the prophet. 1 Samuel chapter 13. He called the prophet to say, prophet, come and assist on me. And the prophet said, there will be a time where I will need you to do a sacrifice. Wait for me. We will sacrifice. And then after the sacrifice, we're going to attack Philistine. 
So he said, bring me. And what happened now in the, the story is that the prophet took long to come. The prophet says, we're going to do the sacrifice at 9 o'clock. It's quarter to 9, the prophet is not there. 10 to 9, prophet is not there. 5 to 9, prophet is not there. 9 o'clock, the prophet is not there. The king waited 30 minutes, the prophet is not there. One hour, it's 10 o'clock, the prophet is not there. But same time, the Philistines are trying to attack them. You know what happened? The king decided to, to offer the burnt sacrifice. And it was not in his place to do. The Bible says so. Uh, the king said, bring me the burnt offering and the fellowship offerings that is not the role of the king to do that is the role of the prophet and Saul offered up the burnt offering he offered up the burnt offering where did his faith in God go that is the question for everybody of us the prophet says wait until I come we sacrifice and then we attack the Philistine for the victory but the problem, the king was looking with his sight, with his eyes. He sees the Philistines approaching. He says, mm, we need the burnt offering and the fellowship offering to be sacked. To be not. He sees the enemy coming and his army is leaping away. He makes his decision. He makes his decision out of fear rather than out of faith. Never make decisions out of fear. Every time you make decisions in your calling, make them out of faith. Hallelujah. He lost his faith in God, in the God who called him, and consequently he fell into the sin of disobedience. Listen to what happened from verse 10. Just as he finished... Making the offering, Samuel arrived and Saul went out to greet him. What have you done? Asked Samuel. Saul replied, when I saw that the men were scattering and that you did not come at the set time and that the Philistines were assembling at Michmash, I thought now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal and I have not sought the Lord's favor. And I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering. You see what he did? He presented excuses. And I've put for you five in red, five killers of faith in the life of Saul here. He says, number one, I saw that the men were scattering. I saw. The problem of faith, faith is not about seeing. Faith is about seeing in your imagination what God is able to do. Believe that God is going to do it and then you're going to see the demonstration of the things that you haven't seen before. I saw that the Philistines were coming. Why did you see? In your calling, you don't have to see. In your calling, you have to foresee what God sees and you have the sight of God. It is called faith. Number two, he said, you did not come at the set time. He says, you did not come at the set time. The problem was now his faith was now on a man who didn't come on a set time. The set time was not the set time of God. That was the set time of the prophet. When you are in a calling, you have always to differentiate between the chronos and the kairos. The chronos is the time that goes every day. Today it's Sunday and now it's 10, 40 minutes. This is the chronos. But the kairos is the time set by God to do something in your life. He doesn't need the clock. He doesn't need the calendar. The calendar. He needs his own time. And when his set time comes, he does what he want to do. Sometimes the set time of man is not the set time of God. Usually it's not the set time of God. You have to believe in God. Not in the prophet time. When I saw that the set time was over. Why are you looking at the set time by the prophet? Seek to know the kairos of God. Number three. And that the Philistines were assembling. Faith is not about that your what the enemy is doing. 
The enemy is getting ready to attack you. But what did God say? When you see your enemy ready to attack you, just know that God has already prepared the counterattack. The young man who was with prophet Elisha, when he went out, opening the window, and he saw an army around the house, he was so scared, he went to the, the, the prophet and said, Prophet, we are done. The army that is outside is so big. We cannot run away from them. The Bible says the prophet prays God and says, God, open the eyes of the young man. Let him see who is protecting us. When he goes out, he says, oh, he looked behind that army that was attacking them. There was a big army, greater than the one that was attacking them. That way, he there to protect them. Then he understood that the one who are for us are so many than the one who are against us. Don't look at your enemies. Look at what God is able to do for you. In your calling with God, when you want to fulfill your calling, you need to increase your faith. Not looking at what the enemies can do, but foreseeing what God is able to do. Number four, he says, I thought, I thought, I thought. Faith is not about thought. It's not about your head, your brain. Faith is about not a feeling. Faith is a firm foundation in the spirit of man. Firm assurance, assurance in my spirit. I don't have to think. I have to be sure. I thought, I thought, I thought, I thought, no, in your calling, don't think. But no. And faith makes you know and not thinking. And finally, he said, I felt compelled. I felt compelled. A man of faith never been felt compelled by the thing that comes outside. The only thing that compels me, it's faith in towards God. And when the instruction of God comes, I will feel compelled. Not by what I see. People of God, you see in that, for that now, the prophet came and spoke to Saul to say, you have done a foolish thing. Samuel said, you have not kept the comment the Lord your God gave you. If you had you would have been established king of this forever. But because of what you have done, God has rejected you. He has decided to take your neighbor to become the king on Israel. Lack of faith will make you to lose the prize of your high calling and this be gone to somebody else. Are you with me? We need to increase our faith, to fulfill the calling of God. Number two, I'm going to speak about it in five minutes quickly. Number two, you need faith. We need faith to see God's works and wonders in our lives. We need faith. All of us want to experience God's miraculous hands in our lives in some way or other. But remember, remember, you cannot experience God's miracle unless... You have faith. <laughs> when you read in Matthew chapter 13, from verse 53 to verse 58, don't put it on the screen, it's fine. Matthew chapter 13, Jesus, the Bible says, he went to his country. And when he arrived to his country, he, 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 he was preaching the gospel. And the people started to look at him to say, mm, this is not Jesus. Is in Tita, his brothers with us here in the choir in the church. Is in Mary, his mother. And they say, oh, but this is Jesus, the son of the carpenter. Isn't it a good carpenter who stays on church street and who makes good <laughs> furnishers? The Bible says, Jesus said to them, a prophet is not recognized in his own country. And because of that, he didn't do many miracles among them. Why? Because these people didn't have faith in Jesus. They looked at him, they said, we know him. We know him. We know him. People of God, can I give you one advice? Don't get familiar to the man of God. To say, I know him. Isn't he the doctor here in this district? Ah, but I know him. Isn't he the father of that girl who studies at Fedis? I know him. Pay attention. 
you might miss your miracle through the man of God because of familiarity. I'm very serious. I do my best not to get familiar to my pastors. I look at my pastors as men of God. Finish and clear. No miracle was done because Jesus said to them, you know me otherwise and I cannot do anything for you. It was the son of God among them. But they wanted to put him in a box of the young men of Pochef's room. Even if you know that man of God is a, a consumer of Nanyaope before, as long as he came to God and God has called him, he's serving him now, respect him as a man of God. We need faith to allow God to do miracles in our midst. Listen to me, faith to God's oracles produce miracles. There is no miracles if you don't have faith in God's oracles. What God has said is able to do it. There's a story, a sad story in Numbers chapter 11 from the, Numbers chapter 11. The Israel people, God prepared them to say, get ready, get ready. Tomorrow I want to do something for you because you have rejected the Lord who is among you. And you have weighed before him saying, why did we ever leave Egypt? He was preparing them. They were in the, in the wilderness to say, you need to be prepared so that God will do things among you. You need faith. You need faith. You need faith. And you know these people, what they wanted? They said to God, it was better for us to remain in Egypt. In Egypt, we had, we, we had cucumbers. But since you took us in the desert here, it's always, always manna, 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 manna. We are tired of manna. In Egypt, we had time to eat chicken. You see, the problem is when you start to lack faith, to lack faith, you think that uh, God cannot do for you things that happened yesterday. Now you start to compare God and you say Egypt was better than now because nothing is going on. <laughs> Hallelujah. God promised them that they're going to eat meat. I'm going to give you meat. You won't get, eat meat for one day, not for two days. Not for a week, not for 20 days, but I'm going to give you meat for 30 days. You're going to eat meat to the point that that meat will start to go out of your nostrils. Because it will be too much. Because of your lack of faith, you didn't believe that I can give you meat. I'm going to give it to you. I want to say in Lingala. In Lingala, they say, by Akineli you. It means it gives you to the point that it is too much. That you see yourself, why did you give me too much? Ah, because you lacked faith before. You didn't believe that he can give. People of God, to cut the story short for me to go and finish my preaching of today, you know what happened? Even Moses didn't believe. Moses started to make calculations. Let's go to verse 21. Moses started to make calculations. He says to God, God, do you know that you have said you're going to give meat to these people? I have 600,000 men on foot. 600,000. That means if you count more with the ladies and the children, we might have more than 1 million. Can you go to the next slide, please? We can, we can go to the 1 million. Now, God, you say you're going to give us meat not for one day, not for two days, but for a month. Well, do you say that all the flocks that we have around, we're going to put them together? You are even able to bring us also food coming from the fish of the sea. And they were not very far from the sea. They have just crossed the sea. Will we be heavy enough? Because now Moses is making calculations. Making calculations. Is God able to give food to all these people meat? He's making calculations. 
He's making calculations. He says, even if you take all our flock and you take all our heads, it won't be enough. Now, if you were there, you overhear this conversation between God and Moses. What will be going to your mind? You'll say what? That God, Moses doesn't believe that God will do it. Isn't it what happened to most of us here? When God promised you something, you start to make calculations. We find it so difficult to trust God's words, trust God's provision and God's care when we go through turbulent times. Don't we make unnecessary calculations like Moses did? When you are short of money and you didn't get buzzed this year, it's just one week before the year starts. You start panicking. Will God give me this buzzer, yes or no? God is able to give you buzzer from somebody where you didn't even apply. Yeah, I'm saying that. And you miss to say amen where you should have said amen. Hallelujah. Calculations. Calculations. Now, the Lord came now, spoke to Moses, verse 23. Because Moses was making calculations. Now the Lord answered Moses, Is the Lord's power limited? Is the hand of God short? Is God's ability so inadequate? That he don't believe that he can do what he says he's going to do. This is God speaking to Moses. I like it in the message version. In the message version he says, So, do you think I cannot take care of you? That's the question of God. Moses, tell me, do you think I, God, cannot take care of you and your people? And if it was in the new covenant and God has to stand up, and rebuke them, he will speak like Jesus. Oh, people of little faith. Hallelujah. Now let me finish by verse 31 to verse 32, what happened. God made a, a miracle. Listen, read that. A wind sent by the Lord came up and blew. Quail came in from, in from the sea. He dropped them at the camp all around. Three feet off the ground. About a day's journey in every direction. Verse 32. The people were up all that day and night. And all the next day gathering the quail. The one who took the least gathered 33 bushels. I will explain to you. And they spread them out all around the camp. Listen to me. Give me one minute. I'm going to finish with you two minutes. God, now to show them that he's able to do that. The Bible says he blew a wind to the sea. Hallelujah. Now ask me the question, where were Israel by that time? Israel was already at three days of their journey from the Red Sea. Three days of journey means today 50 miles. In kilometers, 82 kilometers. Israel found themselves already like from here going to Klax Dop, moving a little bit like going to Volmara start cross with 20 kilometers. They were somewhere there already. Walking from Pochev's room towards Volmara start in the mid of the road. Now, this is the sea. God blew a strong wind because now chicken and fish were supposed not to reach people were at 82 kilometers. And it reached them. What happened? The Bible says they had chicken and fish at the height of one cubit, which is two cubits, which is one meter. Almost here. Chicken and fish at this size. It was going three days of March this side, three days of the camp. Meaning, 20, one day of March, 24 kilometers that side, 24 kilometers this side. The whole Pochef's room is full of chicken and fish. Height of one meter. Going out of the town 24 kilometers, 24 kilometers. So that everybody went and started to gather. 
the whole night, the whole day, filling up their freezers, their fridges. Go to the <laughs> to the point that he says the least one actually took how much? Thirty-three bushel. Thirty-three bushel. It's actually the amount of forty kilogram. The least one, meaning the small children, they had forty kilogram. Elder Henry. Chanel has 40 kilograms. Zudia has 60 kilograms. Ryan is very strong. He will bring 80 to 100 kilograms. More than a mother. The mother will bring 80. Because she's a bit tired. And you bring 140. How many kilograms of meat you have at home? <laughs> In one day and one night. The people who thought that the hand of God was too small. God make it. I'm saying to you, we need faith so that we can see the works of God in our life. And don't ever lack faith because God can prove you opposite of that. He can give you beyond what you think, beyond even your wildest dreams. For that, we pray together, say, God, increase our faith. God bless you. One minute, can you close your eyes and pray? Say, God, increase my faith. God, increase my faith. God, increase my faith. I didn't believe you can heal me from this sickness, but increase my faith today and let me be healed. I didn't believe you are able to provide for me in this tough time, but here I increase my faith. God, provide for me. I didn't believe you can do it, but this morning I come and ask you, Increase my faith. Increase my faith. Increase my faith. Can somebody pray? Increase my faith to believe that I can get that contract. I can get that promotion. Increase my faith to believe that you are able to do that. God asked you a question. Is the Lord's end short? Do you think I'm not able to take care of you? Rabba Sata. Thank you, Jesus. Increase my faith. Increase my faith. Increase my faith. Increase my faith. We're going to give our offering before you say amen to your prayer. You take your offering and say, God, increase my faith. I can increase my giving to you. Maybe you have prepared your offering already and you look at it. You say, I want to increase my faith and I will increase my offering. It might be your last hundred rand. You're thinking to give 50 rand and say, 50 rand I'll keep for the week. I don't know what will happen. But you might have faith today. Take your offering and say, God, increase my faith. I want to give to you. Lord Almighty, thank you for increasing our faith in what we do, for increasing our faith in giving, for increasing our faith in believing that you can give that to us. In Jesus' mighty name, we have then prayed and we say amen.